Welcome to the Winning in Business podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Rissi, and I love talking to business professionals, leaders, and entrepreneurs who are winning in business. Are you ready to reach your next level of success? If so, join us on the Winning in Business podcast as I interview entrepreneurs, business professionals, and leaders who share how they've risen to success. Before we begin, go ahead, hit subscribe and the notification button so you'll be notified each time a new episode is released. Plug in and settle in. You're about to be inspired to rise up to your next level of success. Welcome back to another episode of Winning in Business. This is your host, Kelly Rissi. And today, my special guest is Michelle DiMercurio. And Michelle and I have known each other for years, and I'm so excited to have her on today. So, Michelle, welcome. Thank you so much. And let me share about you. You have a very impressive um, bio here, so I'm going to read it. So Michelle DiMercurio is the Senior Director of Enterprise Information Technology Operations at the Boeing Company. In this role, she has responsibility for the operations monitoring, application management, and user support, as well as incident and problem management for all Boeing business applications and infrastructure. That right there sounds like a lot. So Michelle joined Boeing in 2001, and since that time, she has managed technology teams within IT infrastructure and application development organizations that provide IT solutions to supply chain, finance and accounting, supplier management, engineering, manufacturing, and product support functions across the defense, commercial, and aftermarket businesses. She has experience leading enterprise-wide development projects, sourcing engagements, and major change initiatives. Before joining Boeing, Michelle worked in the business systems group at Cerner Corporation in Kansas City, Missouri. During her time with Cerner, she implemented and supported various business applications, including, including accounting, contract management, order fulfillment, professional service support, and reporting applications. She held the positions of software engineer, team lead, and manager while employed by Cerner. Michelle received her Bachelor of Science degree in computer science from Truman State University and her Master's of Business Administration from Baker University. She is a member of the University of Missouri-St. Louis Information Systems Advisory Board and the Ohio State University Information System and Business Analytics Advisory Board. She also serves as a university relations IT focal to Truman State University and supports the Boeing St. Louis Toastmasters organization. Oh, I didn't know that. We need to talk about that. In the community, (laughs) Michelle is board secretary, volunteer, and therapeutic writing instructor for Treehouse of Greater St. Louis, whose mission is to improve the lives of individuals with disabilities and their families through therapy, recreation, education, and exploration. So Michelle, you have a very extensive and long um, bio. And like, this is why I wanted to have you on here because I know that, well, first of all, I know you as a person and just your level of integrity, your level of professionalism, your level of get things done. (laughs) Uh, And so I'm like, you are always winning in the things that you do. And so that was one of the reasons I wanted to have you on today. So thanks for spending time with us. Well, that is so nice of you to say. I certainly don't feel like I'm always winning. And I'm sure your listener group can (laughs) attest to that. And I will say that it's super fun to hear someone else tell, just read your bio. I, it's, it's very, um, it's a very interesting experience sort of hearing your background from someone else's voice. And um, yeah, it's kind of a, a fun, um, I don't know, kind of uplifting opportunity for the yeah, morning. So thanks yeah. for that. So for you, like, tell us, how did you end up in the space that you're in? And maybe this passion that you have towards it and being in, in this whole IT land, you know, how did you, how did you end up there? You know, interestingly, it probably starts back to when I was a kid. So we won't like do the whole life history thing. But, you know, my dad was always and still is always one that has to have the latest, greatest stuff. Mm. He's just he's, you know, on the tip of that, that, um, that innovators curve. And so we had an Apple Mac, right? We had a Apple IIe when I was a, a kid. And my dad brought, bought me a programming book. because He thought that might be interesting. 
So I didn't do a lot with it as a kid, but right. I did play with it a lot. And I, um, but I went to college not knowing what I wanted to do, never even thought about going into computers. And I just happened to have an advisor who said, well, you don't know what you want to do. You're at a liberal arts school, lots of opportunity. Why don't you take this programming class? See what you think. And I thought, okay, might as well. Don't know what I'm doing. Uh-huh. This was, and honestly, that was really the intro for me. And what happened was one, I loved the class. I love what um, programming brings to me. It's a problem solving sort of mm. puzzle solving kind of type of role where you're trying to make this inanimate device do some really interesting things. And on top of that, I was lucky enough to have a female um, professor for that first class. And that female professor, her name was Ruthie Dare. She recognized in me that I had an aptitude and she pulled me aside after a class one day and said, we don't have nearly enough women in this this field, because back then I really was the only girl in the class and mm-hmm. all through my career, I was the only girl in the class, right? They called me Blondie, all the boys. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if they knew my name, but she pulled me aside and really um, just gave me that nudge to go take another class and then ended up that she invited me to be her TA. So I worked for, for her and did some research under her for the next several years and off I went on this career path that I had never even, it just, it it was never a glimmer. So I, I really think that says something about the power of personal connection and especially in adults, but also, but especially in kids, sometimes they just need a nudge. Mm -hmm. Um, They don't think that that's something that might be good or interesting and they just need that nudge. And I will forever be grateful to Ruthie Dare, who still works at Truman University. Oh, yeah, um, that's great. <laughs> yeah. They, they, I think also kids um, need someone to believe in them. And yes. besides their parents, because, yes. you know, like their parents, you know, quote unquote, <laughs> have to believe in them, right? So that's, you know, but having Yes, person, exactly. Like, you can do anything, about, honey. Yes, exactly. Like, I think that is, <laughs> right. and even today as adults, when we are moving into, I mean, yep. I shifted careers, right? And having right. someone believe that's in right. me as I, as I did that was huge, you know, yeah. because I, haven't, I wasn't in the business world until I was in the business world, you know, right. so, yeah. Right, yeah, absolutely. And then from there, I took the job at Cerner. I was lucky enough to score that job right after school, software company. And then um, we, for personal reasons, decided that was in Kansas City and all of our families in St. Louis. So we decided after the second kiddo came along that, you know, this is silly. Let's just go move back by family. And that's when I got the gig at Boeing. So really lucky how things occurred for me through my career and love it at Boeing. Love the opportunities. You mentioned all those groups I've supported. I've moved around many, many times since I've been at Boeing, all in IT. And it's been just an incredible learning, personal and professional learning journey. So really just feel blessed. You know, for you at Boeing, um, Can you, because you talked about really, as you came up in this industry, being really the only female in the classes, things like that, like how Mm -hmm. did, what was the experience like coming up in Boeing and being the leader that you are today in in a, in a male industry? Yeah. You know, that's, that's a really interesting question, Kelly. And I have a, I have a funny story. Well, and I don't know that it's funny, but an interesting story about taking advantage of being a female at one time in my career. Um, and it's not a cringy story. So just, just okay. hang on tight. But, um, you know, one of the lucky things when I came to Boeing is that I went into my first job at Boeing was supporting the accounting organization, like the accounting IT. So supporting their accounting systems. And interestingly, accounting is one of those degrees that is very female, male, like balanced. And it okay. always has been. It was then. So a lot of my peers. Now, we were still in the IT group, more heavily male dominated, but we recruited a lot from accounting to bring subject matter experts over. So there were a lot of women. So I didn't really feel it in that environment. But my second, um, my next a job or so later was supporting the manufacturing organization. So as you can imagine, highly male dominated, not just the, the IT team, but also the, the customer base right? Factory floor, rough and tough, you know, 
and in, and mostly in the defense business, which is very chain of command, like I'm going to tell you. So very different than my style and sort of what I was used to. And I'll tell you, I had a, a male teammate that uh, came to me and said, Michelle, I need you to attend this particular meeting with me every time it occurs. I was like, okay, but well, that's weird. I mean, he's a very capable leader. And he said, well, let me explain. When you come to the meeting, the men act professional. Oh. Because a female was in the room, yes. right? And a lot of them were of, you know, our parents' generation or even yeah. ours that, right, when a woman is around, you don't cuss. You don't, right? And so, yes. and if they did, they would apologize and pull themselves back. And this gentleman was having trouble getting them to, to cooperate and listen. And by me just being in the meeting changed the whole dynamic. So again, not a cringy, weird thing, but just yeah. like a, wow, this is super interesting. Yeah, very interesting. The, the, the dynamics in <laughs> corporations, in corporate oh my America is very interesting. <laughs> and I feel like the dynamics continue to change. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Like every generation, yeah. the dynamics continue to change. And I think the interesting thing about that is then the, the more generations that are in the workspace together, <laughs> then you just have yes. just the hodgepodge, you know what I mean? Of, of yes. things going on. Yeah. And do you that see is that so right. as a lead? I know at one time you were managing, leading like a lot of people. Yeah. And yeah. I think the largest group I had, which isn't, I don't have it takes we sourced a lot of work, sadly, which is a whole nother experience yeah. in my career. But I think my largest group was about 950 people at one time. Talk about a large, diverse organization, crazy yeah. opportunities for learning and growth and just figuring out how to really connect whatever, however, as much as you can with that kind of a, a size of an organization. Yeah. And with that size of an organization, were they all here in St. Louis or they're all over, oh, like, no. all over the place, right? All over the world. All over the world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now still Boeing at that time was still, and still is significantly U.S. based, but no, my team was in the U.S. My biggest team was in the Washington um, state area. Okay. My, um, but I have, I had a significant number of people in India um, and then people all over Europe, Sweden, um, UK, um, Amsterdam, yeah, just all over the place. So, yeah, so very culturally diverse. Yes. Yeah, so where in your training, your development, your leadership, mm -hmm. where did you learn and develop the skills to handle all the different cultures and everybody, every place? Yeah. You know, Boeing is being a really big company has some amazing resources available and even at that time, some really good resources around, um, and I've forgotten the name of the site that we used to use, but it, it really, you could go in and you could choose by cult, uh, by city, by, um, by country, and really study about like when people use different language, what does it mean? And, but there is, but not, and so I did my homework, but nothing beats personal experience. And yeah. so um, I, when one of the things I did do in one of my roles was I kind of did a country tour and I don't necessarily recommend it. It was a bit of a whirlwind for a two week period to go sort of to multiple countries, but really getting that one-on-one, -on -one, whether it has to be on video or whether you can actually be lucky enough to get in person with someone and just, just have a conversation, learn how they speak and then ask for right feedback um, and create that relationship so you can give each other feedback. So it, it's interesting. I mean, there's really subtle things um, in Sweden. They, my team there is really um, just, uh, can I say the word snarky, like snarky, but in a fun way. But sometimes that can be a challenge because you're not sure. Are you, being, are you trying through humor? being serious and trying to send a message to me, right. right? So being able to have that transparent conversation about, okay, I, I heard you now. Is that really what you want? Right. And yeah, it's very interesting. And then in India, right. They, they nod their head a lot. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean yes. So learning oh. the different body language. Yeah. Or they do the side, right. And as they're listening, 
that doesn't mean that they necessarily understand or agree. It's just their cultural. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's very so interesting. interesting. Yeah. And I know that there are cultures that, you know, have like, they look at you, some don't look at you. You know what I mean? Like there's so many yes. different things about that of really understanding yes. and knowing that so that it's not yes. taken personal or that you're allowing, exactly. allowing it, it to happen organically and not offending and, you know. Yeah. Well, and even in the U S we have a lot of that, right. I mean, there's the, the Midwest, um, nice. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> or can you just tell me what you really feel about this? Right. And then right. Versus like on the coast and, and they're going to let you know right away. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> right? They're very yeah. direct yeah. and being a Midwest nice, right. Reconciling right. the, Oh, you're going to really let me know my Philly person. How you feel. Right. Right. And, right. and you, yeah, exactly. That is so right. Kelly. That's so funny. I, I, <laughs> I, I might have, I might, I may supposed to be an East Coast person because I am one of those people that I'm pretty direct. <laughs> like I'm just pretty direct. Yeah, that's to the point. I am. I'm pretty direct and to the point. And yeah. um, some people are like, "That's a really great quality," and then others are like, <laughs> "Yeah, you're really direct." And I'm like, "Yes, I, I just kind of say it like it is." So you know, that that's well, me. But I think there's, I think there's power in that, right? And I also think you're one of those individuals that that you you have empathy and you yeah. you you receive feedback even if it's body language feedback from who you're with right and so you decide whether or not you're going to do something with that yeah. and i think that's the power right yeah. is whatever your style is embrace it but make sure that you're also recognizing the reaction and deciding yes. if you need to do something yes. with that yes. reaction yeah. i also and like to not. say yeah i also <laughs> like to say that I am direct in a loving way. Like I'm always saying it, love it. Right. Like, like from, it's from the heart. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's so right. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, I mean, we already shared a lot of great nuggets in just that oh. part of the conversation. <laughs> However, um, what do you feel like are some ahas that have really contributed to mm. your success? Yeah, I will say when you asked me this the other day, I really appreciated you asking me this question and giving me the homework because I was telling a coworker that, wow, I think I need to do this like on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful to just sit back and reflect. And so it was in some ways hard to boil it down to just a couple. Yeah. But, <laughs> right? Right? Yes. So, I mean, I would say one of my early career that I still live by. And part of this is how I'm wired. You know, we have this, my husband and I have this joke. He is, he is much more of a perfectionist and things have a way to be done. And I'm much more, Meh, mix it together. It'll work out. Right. So it's like, it'll cook out. And uh -huh. he's like, no, like, you have to put the, the solids in first. And then, <laughs> right? um, but I think that's something that I have really embraced and tried to apply in a very purposeful way through my career is just sort of the, the let it go. Maybe you could say pick your battles, but I think, I think pick your battles is different. And that's more like, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I think let it go is like, there are some things that are really important and you need to invest yourself in them. And then there are others that for whatever reason, you've built them up to be important and they're not. And I can give you a story if you don't mind from yes, my early yeah. career. I was in a really, really challenging program. I was leading it and I was early in my career. So I was learning a ton. I was working a million hours. My vice president at the time used to sleep with his phone on his, on his chest and he didn't require much sleep. So, I mean, and we, I mean, it was truly a 24 by seven. We were having calls all day, all night, all weekend. It was not a healthy job. But at the time I was really struggling because, you know, I had small children and I couldn't keep my house clean and I couldn't get all the errands done. And my boss said, Michelle, who cares about your house? Now I grew up with a mother who vacuumed three times a week and dusted every day. Right. Right. So this is ingrained that I am failing if my house is not clean. And so she said, you are blessed enough to have a phenomenal job mm -hmm. that you can afford to have someone in, come in and clean your house. So stop it. Stop it. If that's so important to you, make a different choice. Otherwise, make it not important and spend that time with your children. Stop cleaning the house. Mm -hmm. And I just 
I mean, it seems like such a little thing, but it was really like a, like a knockback, like, seriously, Michelle, do you have your priorities right? Yeah. 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 I think it's that, like, I look at that as the permission it, it, is, you know yes. what I mean? It's the permission of, we can let something go. And she really yes. opened your eyes to that permission, yes. like either the permission of get yourself a house cleaner or the permission of who cares? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's right. That's right. Your children are healthy. They're happy. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. They want time with you. They don't care if you mop the floor once this week or not at right. all. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. So that was that's probably great. one of my, my great, big ones. That's a great one. Yes. Very good. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say the other big one for me would be always knowing that it's in my control to decide my balance mm. and that I'm in charge of creating my balance and that my balance is not the same as anyone else. And I have a lot of younger women in my field coming to me asking about, how do you, how have you gotten to be an executive and how do you like balance that? Because, you know, Kelly, your our work can take over every hour of our day, if, especially if we love our job, right? And we're yes. passionate about our, yes. our job, right? It can, it can suck up every moment mm -hmm. of your day, but that's not healthy. And, but that doesn't mean that 40 hours is healthy for me. It doesn't mean, you know, a part-time job is healthy for me or 60 hours. So, and I think throughout your life, you have to reevaluate your your balance. So when my children were younger, right, I had the pull of the children. My husband is amazing. So please don't hear that like I was all on my own. I had an amazing support system. I had the crazy job where I like chose really hard work. And then I also felt like I wasn't doing anything for myself. Like I had nothing that that was for me. So I think knowing that I had to choose the balance, I had to like create a reason to make myself leave work besides daycares closing. Right. And get okay with that. But that no one was going to tell me that was okay or stop logging on at night from home and pay attention mm -hmm. to whatever it is you want to pay attention to. Right. Nobody was going to, going to tell me at work to leave. They were happy with me working. Right. Right. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. So I think I had to create my balance. And I remember back when I was incredibly burned out, one of the things I did, and it sounds silly to like add something to your list when you're already overwhelmed, but I joined a community band. And so every Tuesday night, my husband was again, very supportive. Every Tuesday night, I had to leave work by a certain time to get to band practice. And it was only for me. And while I was at band practice, I couldn't think about the kids. I couldn't think about work. I couldn't worry about whether my house was clean. Mm -hmm. It was a complete outlet. And I would just say, especially for young professionals feeling like, you know, there's all these things, find that thing, crochet, knit, exercise, yeah. right? Whatever it is. Do you know that? Um, so, you know, I mean, like that you back then, like that's, that's who I work with. You know what I mean? And I look at, like, <laughs> you know, you know, you found ways and like, I look at myself, however many years right. ago, like, oh my gosh, if I had had a Kelly in my life, like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, like I wouldn't have struggled like I did. Yes. I mean, and yes, we figured it out, but oh my gosh, had we have, yes. had we have had someone like, you know, like me in our lives back then, it probably yes. would have been a lot easier. Um, but one of yes. the things that I find is when I, I do a little activity with my, with my clients, and do you know that most of them, when you mentioned that the band being in the band, most yes. of them, the creativity, which is a huge part of our lives, whatever that means to be creative yes. for someone, exactly. right? Exactly. That is typically yep. for professionals, for entrepreneurs, for business owners, that is the place that is lacking the most. Like all of a sudden you just get to your creative being. And <laughs> like, I loved hearing that you went back and add that because that is a place and then we're not fulfilled. Yeah. Like we don't feel fulfilled yeah. because that is a big yeah. piece that is missing. You know what I mean? So I love that. I think that is so right, Kelly. And that's super sad, right? That we, cool. that we let that piece of ourselves go. It reminds me of that pie. I remember in some of the Boeing training and maybe use the pie as well yes. of like yes. spiritual, professional. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That we just, we don't attend to the pie and sometimes you can't, that's mm -hmm. okay. You can't attend yeah. to the whole thing, but yes. yeah. Yeah. The other thing I talk about, which I feel like this is really what you alluded to as well, is, um, you know, balance. Balance is not 50-50. Yeah. 
Like I, we're never going to no. find like balance. And we need to stop <laughs> looking for 50, 50, because it's not. Yeah. Like that. And yeah. We need a different word. It. Don't we? Yes. It's really <laughs> finding the harmony. It's fine. Oh, I like that. You know what I mean? Like what works. And, and when you have younger like kids, that. you're going to have a different harmony than you are at our That's age. Right. You know what I mean? Like That's it's, right. it's different. So that's and, absolutely right. Yeah. And like you said, yeah. you, you kind of reevaluated that along the way and, you know, you get, we yeah. get to adjust it and change it and, you know, <laughs> which is, which is, yeah. great. and for all of you out there that have, you know, young children, not even young children, because think about when our no. kids, so Michelle oh and I know gosh. each other, our kids played hockey together. And I mean, when mm-hmm. your kids are playing sports oh. or, or whatever their passion is and, and, <laughs> you know, they're in those years that then you're just driving all over the place. Like oh, that's always worse God. than when their kids and at home, like the, yes. little, the little ones, at least they're at home, at home, you know, then you're driving oh. all over the place and doing <laughs> stuff. And, and then you're, you're almost like praying for the day when your kids can drive and, and that opens right. a whole new world <laughs> when your children start that's driving. Right. So my friends I out there that are not... working, yeah, that are working <laughs> just, and that have young kids hold tight. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I know I do say it doesn't get easier. It just changes. But yes. I do think once they get past some of those high school years, I do think it gets easier. I, yeah. yes. I mean, you never yeah. stop worrying, but yeah. 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 Um, so for you, what would you say some of your biggest stressors have been? And you might've mentioned them, but what do you think are your biggest stressors yeah. kind of challenges Uh-oh. as, as this high level professional, because we, yeah. I mean, we all have our challenges. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think in my day job, in my like work, what I get paid to do, I think my biggest stressors are always about, so I I definitely have the wired like people pleaser gene, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, and I've had to like manage that for myself over the years, but I still think that's always a challenge. Like, am I doing enough? Or am I doing the right things? Am I doing it well enough? Um, are my people happy? What are, when I said something in a meeting, did it come across the right way? Right. It's like all that subconscious battling yeah. and it's like your internal critic, right? So my yes. internal critic is sometimes too loud. Mm-hmm. So I think that's always something I struggle with. Um, besides that, you know, the hardest parts of my career have been because I really do care a lot for my people have been when I've had to go through layoffs or, you know, giving yeah. bad news or those are just, those are soul bruising experiences. Um, so I, I think yeah. in my career, those have been the hardest. And then I would say in my outside my career, it's about, you know, there have been lots of times where, you know, just keeping your marriage healthy is hard work. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, right? Being enough for your kids without being too much. Um, yeah, just, yeah. 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 It really is. It, it, I mean, it goes back to that whole, like, like harmony thing, like everything requires work. We have to put work and effort into yeah. everything. As soon as we start yeah. putting work and effort into our health, well, you know, it may not be tomorrow that we have health problems, but we're going to have health That's problems. Right. As soon as we That's start right. putting effort into our marriage, relationships, like we're going to have problems and it's really learning how to put the right amount of effort in where we need and keeping our own cups filled up. I mean, it really is a puzzle and it's a, and we can all do it. Like, that's the whole thing. Like, like we were put on this earth, like this, I truly believe this. We were put on (laughs) this earth to do amazing things, to, to impact the world with our greatness right? And whatever your gifts are and I agree and we can do it. It's, 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 and I'm going to go back to what exactly what you said. Sometimes (laughs) it is, well, I'm going to say all the time it is taming the inner critic. Yeah. Right. That is so right. And I, I feel and live with that every day and I'm sure lots of your clients and listeners. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think that's human. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, that is one of the biggest yeah. pieces that actually, no matter what my clients come to for, it's always the mindset piece. We are always working yeah. on the mindset piece because yeah. as, especially, especially the women, right. Of, yes. of, you right. know, coming up, we're not enough. We're not smart. Blah, 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 blah. Like all <laughs> the crap. You know, it's really challenging those beliefs. Yeah. 
and getting us to I agree. Think and think in different ways. But, you know, really, yeah. like you said it like taming that inner critic. That is definitely <laughs> something, you know, when I go out and speak, I talk about um, stress personalities. And when I talk oh. about the stress person, well, I like to make it fun. And I feel like yes. when we talk about yes. stress personalities, we can eventually <laughs> like laugh at ourselves because we're like, oh yeah, like, that is oh. me. And then I give like solutions to go with the stress personalities because when we can recognize and catch ourselves in those, right? right then we can be like, oh, hang uh, right. on. Like I'm creating, stress is a mind game. And we are all creating oh, our own stress. That is so right. Right? That and is so, so when, right. When we can speak, Stop, I'm going to say blaming others for our stress, which I used to do that as well. You know what I mean? If my husband yep. would just do this, if work, went, I'm like, whatever, <laughs> hang on a minute. Like, really, it's me. It's me and how right. I'm thinking about the situation. You know what I mean? Yep. All of that. So anyway, yep. that's one of the things I do is talk about stress. No, I love that. I love that. I'll have to, I'd yep. love to hear or like see where I fit in your stress personalities. That's awesome. And I yep. think what you talk about resonates with, I just started teaching this class at Boeing. Um, that's a leadership class and it's all about conflict management, but it's not actually about conflict management. Really. It's about giving people tools to work through conflict, yes. but really it's about, recognizing sort of exactly what you said. How am I reacting to the situation? How am I coming? Yeah, exactly. Yes. And one of the really cool models we use, oh, I won't remember who created it, but there's, have you heard of the victim mastery cycle? Well, oh, I don't know if I've heard of it that way, but what, explain it. I've yeah, so the idea it. is that when, when something is coming at you, a change or somebody comes, maybe somebody has an idea or there's something that's impacting you, um, the victim cycle is basically where you get into like blame and I don't have any choices and I, right? Like yes. I'm a victim in this situation. And at some point, unless you can get yourself out of victim, you will like, nothing will change. It, it's yes. bad. It's a bad place to be, right? It's stressful. The mastery is when you recognize, okay, I do have choices. I may not like my choices. Yes. They may be really hard choices, but I have choices. Someone's not doing, they might be doing this to me, but I have a choice. And that's yes. that mastery cycle of now yes. you've learned something, you're thinking, you're, you yes. know, you're, and yes. I, I just, I love that model. And one of the things we talk about in that class is, you know, if you can recognize when you're in that victim cycle, mm -hmm. right, then you can more quickly get yourself out of it. Yes. And get into a much better mind space. And I think that resonates or that ties really well with what you were talking about. Yes. So, and one of the, one of the trainers that, um, that I learned some of my mindset with, it's always the, um, choice is a powerful thing. Suffering is optional. And when you stay, oh, in I the, like that. Yes, when you stay in the victim mindset, you are staying in right. suffering when you have choices. Yes. And I think the other thing, you know, that is so important for people to realize is that, Everything in our life, whether we like it or not, we have to yep. come to the realization that we have created all of it. Because if we That's have right. created the good, we have also <laughs> created the bad, right? And, that's and, right? and and that's just the way it is. And we can also <laughs> like learn from that. You know what I mean? Like yes. what part of my thing so right. caused this to happen? Or you know what I mean? And, and it's it's just a it's yeah. just a lesson, right? And I think if we can like that's get right. into that just it's a lesson and what's the lesson I can learn with from this, then we can That's also, right. I'm going to go back and say, we can also tame that inner critic because it's just a yes. lesson. It's just a lesson. Yes. What's the lesson? Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I That's that level Michelle, of like, you know, I, you and I both, we have great kids. We have great kids. Right? <laughs> we have great and kids. I, and, and after all that I've learned and, you know, the things that I've done in the last 10 years, I seriously wish I could go back and like raise my kids one more time. With, right. You know I mean? Okay. I'll have my grandkids. Like I'm just waiting for my grandkids. <laughs> Mold them a little differently. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So I would say, you know, even if I knew everything I did now, Kelly, I'm not sure that I would change it. Cause I, I mean, like you said, we have amazing children. Yeah, we do. They've grown right. up to we be do. very good, caring, yeah. productive members of society. So yeah, it's. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> right. And now I just get to pass on things to them. And, you know, now yes. I just get to, 
passing on things to them. So it's all good. Exactly. So you, I want to talk a minute about, um, and I think that, you know, for you, one of your big accomplishments is what you, what you're now doing in the horse space and that oh, therapy space. Yeah. So um, yeah. as, as we come to wrap it up here, will you talk about, will you talk about oh. that and what you're doing? Cause I, I think, would love I think to it's fabulous. Yeah, I would love to. This is not something I ever dreamed of doing. I, my daughter um, has some special needs, pretty minor, very lucky. But one of the things that we found for her that was more fun than therapy, physical and occupational therapy was horseback riding. And there's a barn here in St. Louis called Treehouse of Greater St. Louis that really um, is all about therapeutic riding. So they do hippotherapy where it's a true therapist, like a PTOT speech. Mm -hmm. right? Um, that's involved with the client or they do therapeutic writing, which doesn't require a therapist, but gives similar benefits for individuals with autism, social challenges, ADHD, physical, you know, uh, cystic fibrosis, any, like any kind of thing. Um, and the, what I remember sharing with you, Kelly, that I just am so fascinated about is beyond the horse person connection that is just phenomenal, um, it's similar to like an, a dog or a cat that someone might, if you have an animal and you think about when that animal comes and sits by you, it's just, it's just a, a calming sort of centering being mm-hmm. horses are much that way, but also the movement of the horse. If you ever look at a horse from the back and you watch their back hips move, it mimics the movement of a human's hips. Cool. And so when an individual who maybe isn't as strong or as flexible or, sits on the horse, if, even if they can't walk, that horse is mimicking the walking movement and putting their body into that movement, which is super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Just phenomenal. Yeah. Super cool. But after Maddie rode there for years and now she's an adult and I took her to, to ride there. And my mom was also a big part of that to help me be part of taking her to riding lessons. And I saw what it did for her. And I also saw what it was like for some of the families. Who had, who had individuals that they were caring for, whether they were their children or, mm-hmm. or whomever, when they would come to the barn. And I remember one morning in particular, one family came in and you could tell it had just been a terrible morning. And this little individual, I won't even say it was a child because a lot of these individuals, are their growth is, is different, um, came in and that person was having a meltdown. And I watched them get that individual mounted on the horse And just within the first couple of steps leaving the block where they mounted, just an entire change in demeanor. And just, you can see in the family faces too, right? Okay, this is going to reset our day, right? I just, since then, I just thought I've got to give back, not only because of all the things it did for Maddie, but because this is truly life-changing for these families and these individuals. And so once my kids got old enough that I didn't have to be running around and yeah. present as much and they weren't present, I started volunteering. And I, a couple of years ago, one of the therapists there pulled me aside. And again, like in college said, Hey, Michelle, I think you'd be a really good instructor. You should think about that. Mm-hmm. Never would have yeah. ever dreamed. Right. And so I, muddled about it for a while and then eventually took the jump to go figure out what it would take. And I just received my certification in December. So I've been teaching some classes. I've got two classes, three students each. Again, another phenomenal learning experience. Um, But just just super rewarding and just really blessed to be able to give of anything that I might have back to these individuals. Um, Yeah. So yeah. Well, and I love that, you know, and, and the other thing I heard from that is just giving back to the individuals. But another thing that I heard from that is just you being the constant learner. Yes. You yes. know what I mean? That we are never too old yeah. to continue to learn. Oh my and God. And in our learning, then we go and we either mentor <laughs> others or we, you know, share our gifts right. with others or whatever that is just to continue. Yeah that because again I'll go back to you know what we talked about earlier is we are on this earth to do big things and make an impact and I don't feel like that stops at a certain age you know I think that like we just continue doing that and it and it looks different in every age that we are I agree or whatever life life phase you're in right that regardless of age right maybe yeah 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I because agree. When, when we, when you have young kids, I mean, you're pouring into your young kids, you know what I mean? Like that's oh, where gosh, all yeah. your energy is going. <laughs> um, and then, you know, as, as they get older and more independent, then you can start doing things in other places. So absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for asking about that. I really love it. And it's just super powerful. And I, I will just say, I get so much out of, even before I started teaching, just, volunteering and giving of myself. I, I can't tell you, I don't know what that saying is, Kelly, but something about when you give, it comes back like yes. threefold or whatever yes. it is, whatever that saying is. Yes. I, that is so true. And it doesn't even matter how much, like you spend an hour a month. It's huge how much that really just feeds your soul. Yes. Um, you know, I, um, I mentor, uh, I mentor someone and it's, you know, as a mentor, you're always think, okay, what can I, you know, what am I going to, how am I going to help this person? But, and and yeah. what we receive from that person that, you know, oh my gosh. coming. I mean, and I don't even think that they understand that of like mm-hmm. what they give back to us also, you know what I mean? Which is I agree. Just so cool. Yeah. It's really cool. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Any other accomplishment? I mean, I brought this accomplishment, oh, gosh. but any other accomplishments that you would <laughs> oh, like to share? Gosh. You know, I always let I know. always like people to brag on themselves. You know what I mean? Well, thanks. I mean, I would just say like my career in general, I have been both lucky and I hope good, and which is why I've been so blessed in my career. And I would just say, you know, a lot of that's been being in the right place at the right time, making sure that I've always done the best job I can in whatever job I'm in. Mm -hmm. whether I'm loving it or not. Right. And just Mm -hmm. making sure that I'm doing the right thing. But I also think um, one of the things I think I'm really proud of is just being willing to say yes um, during certain times when maybe yes wasn't obvious or comfortable. Mm. Right. And I've had that a couple of times in my career where Someone asked me if I would like to go interview for this or interview for that or take over a program. And I mean, my instant reaction wasn't yes, but it was like, okay, well, this is a learning opportunity. So yes. And I mean, really, that's how I've gotten where I am in my career. So I think, I think that's something I'm really proud of is being willing to say yes. Now, not to crazy, like we haven't done any, I so admire people who are willing to like, move their family across the country or across the world. Like I've not said yes to those, but I mean, just even sometimes the small lesson lessons. Um, and then I would just go back to, you know, my family. I'm yeah. really proud of my partnership with my husband and my children. I'm just so happy with how they've grown up and that we still have a very tight family. And mm-hmm. right. I just, I would say those are maybe some of the things I'm most proud of. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, it, it, what I heard when you were talking about the yeses, it's that goes back to the getting out of your comfort zone. Oh, God. You know what I mean? Yeah. For, and then look where that yeah. has led you, you know? And again, yeah. it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be, if here's our comfort zone, it doesn't have to be way over here. It no. just needs to be outside no. of the comfort zone, you know? Yeah, and that's exactly. What you're doing. Which then look yeah. where that led you. It led you to opportunities right. and the next opportunity. And you, you kept doing that, which is, you know, right. which is so great. And, and yeah. that is something yeah. that I think um, all of us also, that there's the saying, right? We have to get, 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 com- we have to get comfortable living in the uncomfortable. I had to think about that. For that's a minute. right. Get comfortable living yeah, in the uncomfortable. That's right. Yeah. 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 That's right. And I think it's okay to, be centered in the comfortable for some period of time, but I think you can't stay there forever or it goes back to that growth and learning, right? You stop learning, you stop growing. Yeah. And it doesn't always have to be, you could be comfortable here, but maybe not here. And so you leave that comfortable alone and then maybe take it sort of like the, the, becoming the instructor. That was not yes. comfortable. Right. That was very scary <laughs> and a lot of work. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So I like that. I really like that you, the way you tied that together. That's yeah. 
Well, I congratulations like on all your success. So oh, thank for, you. Um, yeah, for my followers, they can find you. Is LinkedIn the best place to just connect with you? Yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Yep. So I will um, I will put uh, your LinkedIn link in the, in the show <laughs> notes for the, to connect Great. with you. And um, thank you for all your valuable insights. I feel oh, like we could have talked for another Kelly. half hour just on, you know, mindset <laughs> and culture and like all kinds of different things. Yep. So uh, I I appreciate you and thank you for joining yeah. me today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I again, I appreciate the the chance for some self reflection. That's super super powerful, and I I appreciate that. And Kelly, amazing work you're doing. I hope that we continue to stay in touch. I appreciate you as a friend as well, and and all the success back at you. Yeah, thank you. All right, and for the listeners today, uh, thank you for listening. And I would love it if you would share this with someone, like and comment, and please subscribe to the channel. And I will see you next week. Thank you for being a part of the Winning in Business podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode and want to rise up to your next level of success, but are worried about increased stress, time for work and yourself and your family, not to mention being exhausted, I'd like to invite you to a complimentary strategy call where I'll show you how you can do it all. I'll help you reclaim time, keep your sanity, handle the chaos with ease, and move to the next level of success that you deserve and desire. I hope you found value in listening today. Please always leave your comments, feedback, or questions. We check them all. I want you to continue winning in business and reach your next level of success. See you next time.